So I now give you Adolf Yonke, recipient of the 2023 Lehigh Hensey Award for Outstanding Contributions to the Geology of Utah. And thank you for those kind, kind words. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, members of the Utah Geological Association, uh, the Utah Geological Survey, and others who have supported the Lehigh Hensey Award. I feel honored, humbled, and fortunate to have spent much of my life studying the geology of Utah, trying to understand it and building on the work of so many others, many of whom are here in this room. So uh, the title here is Rock Tales. So imagine you're looking out your office window. I feel fortunate at Weber State. This is my view. And I wonder, you know, what did the landscape look like 20,000 years ago? Maybe 100 million years ago, maybe 2 billion years ago. Um, what do the rocks tell us? What tales do they hold? And so today I want to give you a taste of some of these, these tales and hopefully inspire your imagination of what the geologic history of Utah is, how amazing it is. Uh, I want to start by uh, thanking many people who made this journey possible, starting with my mom here and the younger me. Uh, yeah, this is Utah, our Wyoming uh, field work going across the windswept hills there near Thermopolis. And those experiences really piqued my interest in geology in general, and in specifically how mountain belts form. Uh, this journey would not have been possible without the tremendous support of my family. Uh, my spouse here is Mary Ellen. I'll introduce her there. Um, and our three children, none of whom went into geology, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> somehow knowing better. I also want to um, thank my colleagues at Weber State and other universities uh, who it's been amazing to work with, including this is Arlo Weil, mentioned uh, from Bryn Mawr College, and we've been working for the last 20 years, essentially, from the Andes to Utah to Wyoming to understand mountain formation. And finally, uh, it's just been a pleasure to work with and teach and mentor so many students over the years. Uh, just some examples of field trip, uh, field work uh, in Argentina and in Utah. And of course, this isn't possible without some money, so I want to also thank support of the National Science Foundation and Weber State University, in particular, the Office of Undergraduate Research there. So we're going to look at five tales here, and I've brought some rocks that I'll be handing around as we talk about each of these. So the first one's going to be the basement. We're going to look at really old rocks going back almost two and a half billion years when we were forming our crust. The second tale will be Snowball Earth, when perhaps all of the planet was covered in ice at the end of the Proterozoic, and when we were sitting in part of a supercontinent, not Pangaea, but the one before called Rodinia. Um, we'll fast forward a little bit to the Jurassic and the Great Sand Pile, the Navajo Formation. Margie will appreciate that. <laughs> And then talk about the severe fold thrust belt, an Andean style mountain belt that extended from Alaska to Mexico and key exposures here in Utah. And then finish with a, a brief tale of Lake Bonneville and the active Wasatch Fault. So I'm going to be covering roughly two and a half billion years of history in the next 50 minutes or so, which, uh, if anyone knows my time estimation skills, you're probably worried right now. <laughs> Okay, so tail one, the basement. And what do we mean by basement? These are the high-grade metamorphic igneous rocks that form much of the crust and are commonly covered by younger sedimentary rocks. But they really hold keys for, for how the crust has evolved. And we're fortunate here in Utah to have exposure of these basement rocks, something called the Farmington Canyon complex uh, on the central Wasatch Range here and Antelope Island. And these basement rocks formed in an interesting setting. Okay, we're at the confluence between multiple different basement blocks that came together to make ancestral North America. The Wyoming province that has older Archean gneiss terrains, the Grouse Creek block in northwest Utah with late Archean rocks, uh, the Yavapai province, which was a bunch of island arcs kind of like Philippines and Japan, 
but coming together 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago. By the way, GA here, when you see that, billion years. Okay? And then this enigmatic Mojave province that is also early Paleoproterozoic, but incorporates very old material from Archean crust somewhere. So we're lying at the intersection of this. So it's not surprising past studies had come up with differing interpretations. It's a complicated setting. So that kind of motivated uh, myself and uh, Liz Balgor, Dave Maddy, other folks at Weber State University to work with students because these rocks are exposed in our backyard. And so over the last uh, few years, we've had over 15 students involved in undergraduate research as we try uh, to understand the evolution of these rocks, including some of the people uh, here in this room. Okay, uh, so it's been a you know, an amazing journey. Uh, I think you've learned a lot from that. Um, and this has led to presentations by students at multiple regional and national meetings, uh, recently including uh, the Geological Society National Meeting uh, in Pittsburgh. So Farmington Canyon Complex. Complex means complicated. <laughs> Grant's uh, agreeing because uh, starting out on Antelope Island many years ago mapping these. So there's different rock types. So one uh, shown here uh, is a granite gneiss. Nice. These are large exposures uh, that we found out represent large, huge granite plutons. Associated with these are these complicated layered gneisses um, and they have quartzite in them, they have schist in them. And these represent metamorphism of sedimentary rocks. And so again, with these, we have these quartzites. And I've brought um, one of those here. And I'll be passing it around. And uh, it's very special. It has some very old things in it, including a zircon grain, one of them that we dated at 3.9 billion years old, inherited, recycled, uh, which is even older than what students think I am. So. <laughs> Uh, we also have amphibolite that represents some sort of mafic dikes, scabro dikes, and perhaps basalt flows of multiple ages. And then these late stage granites and pegmatites. So I'm going to pass a couple of rocks around here because rock tails. Uh, this is one of the nices. It's 2.45 billion years old. And I'll show you how we know that. And it was quartzite that started out as a sediment that incorporated cryo grains eroded from some ancient Archean craton. We think the Wyoming province, including a grain 3.9 billion years old. So how do we determine the ages, the significance of these rocks? So we're going to use something called zircon geochronology. Um, so zircon is a common accessory mineral shown here, and it contains uranium. And the uranium uh, comes in two isotopes that decay at different rates to two isotopes of lead. Okay? Uh, so this gives us a check. Um, also, zircon grains are commonly recycled. Okay? So if they form in some ancient mountain system, they can get incorporated to, in, to another sedimentary rock that gets into another mountain system, and we can resolve that history. Okay? Uh, so again, there's two different systems here. Uh, shown on these two axes, and if the age of a grain agrees, we call it concordant. It lies along this line, and depending on how far to the right it is, how much lead's accumulated, that gives us the age. Um, a lot of this work, most of it has been done at the uh, Arizona Laser Cron Center uh, with students going down there and visiting and working. Uh, just for a sense of scale, maybe it's kind of hard to imagine with the uh, rocks going around. I pulled out a hair here, imagine that. That's about the size in diameter of one of those grains. And at the center, we can use a laser beam to go in and ablate out individual parts of that, say in a core or a rim that form at different times. We can get down below 20 microns in size on these laser beams. So pretty amazing technology that's been developed. So we're going to Look at some results here. These granite nice bodies, these huge things, we dated, surprisingly, they come out almost two and a half billion years old. Um, 
Many of the grains are along Concordia here, a few that lie off have lost some lead um, due to radiation damage. Uh, this is, we uh, image these with a scanning electron microscope to target initially. This is an example here. Um, and then we go and zap them with lasers. Um, outcrop photo here. So really old rocks. That's the basement. Uh, we also have these layered gneisses, and by paranice, we mean a gneiss that started out as a sedimentary rock. Okay? And it's interbedded with schist that would have started out as like a shale, and quartzites that start out as a sandstone. And this is just one mound of these grains. Again, each of these is like 100 microns, a tenth of a millimeter in size. Um, and so we go in and we zap these, not only the cores, uh, that record the sediment sources for these gneisses, but also in some of these, and we'll show an example in a bit of the rims that grew during metamorphism when these sediments turned into gneisses. Okay. Um, uh, here's one example of just what we do on the computer screen, trying to pick out these different sites um, to hit, see what we can find. It's kind of like a slot machines in Wendover. <laughs> you hit it with a laser and boom, up comes an age. Uh, so we've done 16 samples to date. We'll be collecting a few more this fall and students running things uh, uh, this coming March. And uh, these uh, red dots here are the ages, concordant ages of individual detrital zircon cores. These are grains that were eroded from some distant basement source, deposited as a sediment, and then later turned into gneisses in the Farmington Canyon. Uh, the red line is just essentially a smooth histogram, and the blue is if you're into statistics, we won't worry about that. <laughs> so there's kind of three different groupings of gneisses that we've found. Some of them have a dominant Archean mode, so they go from about 2.6 billion to 2.9 billion. Sometimes we get 3 billion, even 3.9 billion year old grains. We think those were sourced from the Wyoming province, that sediment that came here. Um, some of them also show this mode of 2.45 billion year old grains, which means that we're recycling, we've eroded, we've taken those granite plutons from depth and exposed them at the surface as these sediments are accumulating. And then finally, some of them have quote unquote younger grains, only like 1.9 to 2.3 billion years old. And we think those were sourced from volcanic activity that was going on as these sediments were accumulating in some ancient sedimentary basin. And we'll come back to the setting on that here in a second. And we like lots of data, so there's all 16 of those histograms plotted together. So complex? Yeah. Um, we've also targeted the rim. So you may see a bright core here. That's the detrital. That came from, say, the Wyoming province deposited in a sediment. We're then going to bury it down to 15 miles, 25 kilometers in the crust, and metamorphose it. Temperature is only like 700 degrees C, so hotter than a pizza oven. And we form these rims that we can also blast with the laser and get ages. And what we get is a variety of roughly 1.6 to 1.8 billion years old. So it was multiple phases of metamorphism, deformation in the roots of some mountain system deep in the crust. Now this is a thin section, a photomicrograph of one of these samples. This is a biotite um, uh, schist, the biotite uh, shown in kind of the brown color here. And this is, we uh, show them in plain polarized light cross polars so we can identify different minerals. The mineral that goes black under cross polars is garnet. So we have biotite garnet, and importantly, this kind of uh, funky looking stuff here is sulmonite, and that tells us we're hot, like 700 degrees C, um, what is that, like 1100 Fahrenheit. So intense metamorphism, 1.8 to 1.6 billion, and we have these late stage granites and pegmatites, uh, very tricky to date, and they come in at about 1.65 billion at the end of this mountain building event. Okay, so we have 2.45 billion, we've got some 2 billion stuff, and we've got some 1.6 billion stuff, which 
when you think about it, what is the Phanerozoic last? A little over 500 million. We're talking 800 million years of history here. And so here's our model uh, of 800 million years in the next 30 seconds. So 2.45 billion years ago, huge granite plutons. I mean, they make up a good part of Antelope Island, a good part of the area uh, towards Mount Ogden, um, beneath Willard Peak, big granite plutons. There were also some layered mafic things that came in and gabbro dikes. We don't know exactly what the country rock is. We have an isotopic signature of it, but we haven't actually been able to see that. It's sitting down there somewhere. Okay. We then uh, erode some of this away, probably have some faulting, make a rift basin, and we deposit a whole layer of sedimentary rocks. Some of these are like arcoses, some are like quartz sandstones, some are shales. We intrude these with mafic dikes, maybe some basalt lava flows. And this is spanning somewhere in the range of 2.3 to 1.9 billion years ago. We then take that, take it down into middle to deeper crustal levels, metamorphose it, deform it multiple times, transpose things around, and this is what you end up with. Which again, where do we get the name complex? From that, okay? And so this happened as we were making some huge mountain system. And towards the end of that mountain system, we started, it got so hot, we started to melt those rocks and made these late stage granites and pegmatites that came in. Okay. So this is kind of weird to think, you know, what, what would it have looked like here two and a half billion years ago? Well, there wouldn't have been much, if any, oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, you don't have plants, that sort of thing, and we think we were part of this first super craton that developed on Earth called Superia that's been proposed. And that's based on finding these 2.45 billion year old granite plutons with a very distinctive chemistry in parts of the Wyoming province, here in Utah, Karelia Kola, that's Finland and Russia, and Superior Southern Canada, and I'm not shown in here, the Ray Hearn in Northern Canada, all have these weird plutons and huge mafic dike swarms that extend for, that's a scale bar of 300 miles. And so we think that was a massive hotspot, or other people, I agree, um, came up and interacted with this super craton and started to split it apart. And there was a second plume that came in about 2.1 billion years ago that finally did the job. But 2.45 billion years ago, we would have been in some landscape, massive volcanic eruptions on Earth's first super craton. And then all of these take their separate way. This one goes pretty far over its history. Um, we end up coming back to the Wyoming province at this time about 1.8 to 1.6 billion years ago. When we made not a super craton, but the start of a big continent, okay? Uh, ancestral North America that's called Laurentia. And we would have been located where Archean blocks like the Wyoming province were coming together with these island arcs, like the Yavapai, this unusual crustal mixed confused block called Mojave, and the Farmington Canyon right here. So this would have been a mountain system that extended, so here's the Avapai, uh, and it's also terrains related, here's Farmington, from the southwestern US all the way towards Greenland. So this would have been something on the scale or maybe bigger than, and longer certainly, than the Himalaya mountains that we see today. So just imagine, you know, the landscape here then be amazing. Um, so we build this incredible mountain system up and now we're going to wear it down over the next 800 million years. But at the same time we're going to add on some more mountain systems including the Grenville province in eastern uh, North America or Laurentia as we suture together additional continents and make a supercontinent called Rodinia, 
which is by a billion years ago. And that's going to take us to our next tale, which is Snowball Earth and the Supercontinent. So I'm going to have a couple of other rocks here I'm going to pass around. Uh, this is a rock called a diamictite deposited by an ancient glacier. Uh, this comes from um, Antelope Island. We think it's about 700 million years old, plus or minus some change. And overlying it, and actually collected this one with Zach, it's not from Antelope Island, but um, related rock, Brown's Hole. That's what's called a cap carbonate or cap dolomite. And if you want to go find carbonates accumulating today, where do you go? Like the Bahamas. So how do we get these two rocks like this? So we'll be looking at that in this tale. So 750, 800 million years ago, we were located. Here is Laurentia, ancestral North America. Here's Utah in the heart of the supercontinent called Rodinia. Okay. This continent started to break apart. We're pretty sure some of the blocks that were nearby to us included uh, East Antarctica, Australia, and then some weird things like North China, Trim, and something called Zealandia. And so we're starting to break this huge supercontinent apart. But that was not complete until we got into the Cambrian. So we're talking 200 million years to break apart Rodinia or more. Okay. And this early rifting sets the stage for what's called snowball earth. So we have a supercontinent along the equator, massive volcanic eruptions as we break it apart, weathering of that depositing then the sediments in these basins around it, and that sequesters carbon dioxide and draws down the <coughs> atmospheric greenhouse gases. I'm going to look briefly uh, a little more closely at Utah here, because it's going to set the stage for subsequent uh, tales. Uh, about 750 million years ago uh, to 780 million, we had uh, these uh, mafic dikes come in. Uh, these extend all the way up into Canada. So this is an early hot spot. And we had some intercratonic basins like in the Uinta Mountains, the big cottonwood formation, connecting up with the Chuar in Arizona, the Prump in California. So we're starting to kind of pull things apart. But it's not until around 710 to 670 million that we really get that early rifting going. Um, and so if you would have been here, AI stands for Antelope Island. Imagine being there or in Salt Lake City. We would be on the edge of this rift basin forming out into Nevada. Normal faults, volcanoes, and we'd be covered under maybe several miles of ice. Okay, uh, But breaking up is hard to do, is the saying, right? <laughs> and the same is true here. Uh, not shown, but this early rift did not go to completion, which is common of rifts. And instead, we were left with a basin that slowly subsided. The glaciers had retreated, and we accumulated a lot of sandstone. This is what's called the Lower Brigham Group that we see, thousands of feet of sandstone. And then the second pulse comes through somewhere around 580 to 530 million years ago. And more normal faults, but this time concentrated out in Nevada. And eventually, the final bits of ribbons and continents out there break off, and we form a passive margin. Okay. And at this time, uh, the seas come in. And I forgot to uh, note one thing on here. Does anyone remember where Laurentia was located? Ancestral North America when we looked at those reconstructions. But very close, almost on the equator. And we know that from paleomagnetism. My friend Arlo Wow, collaborators, worked on that. Uh, so we were at the equator and turned 90 degrees on our side, it turns out. So just hard, hard to imagine. So this would have been, at the start of the Cambrian, a tropical sea that is coming in. And this also sets the stage. We have something, and Lehigh Hinsey worked extensively on this, called the Wasatch Hinge Line or Wasatch Hinge Zone. 
and it separates kind of the craton here where we have thin sedimentary rocks from this rifted, stretched, thin crust where we then accumulated 15 kilometers of sedimentary rocks out in western Utah and parts of Nevada. So let's get to a little bit on snowball earth. Amongst these uh, really thick deposits out there, we find glacial deposits. So glaciers don't discriminate, right? They carry rock, ground up rock flour, pebbles, cobbles, and how about that boulder for size? Uh, so there I am, uh, with Spencer, another uh, student at Weber State uh, on Fremont Island. So these are ancient glacial deposits, we think. Uh, have this photo, a uh, helmet doling here and uh, on Antelope Island, what, back in the late 1980s? Um, again, look at the size of these clasps being brought in. Okay. Um, and also on Antelope Island, we find these weird things called drop stones. And this tells us that the glaciers came out over marine waters, okay? And as the bottom of that ice was melting, you know, sand and mud layers would accumulate. And every now and then a larger chunk would come out and it would fall and hit the ocean bottom. So when we see these drop zones, it tells us glacier, it tells us marine, the paleomag tells us we're near the equator. So if we're getting glaciers here, what do you think is going to happen to the rest of the world? Most likely we'll have ice as well. Uh, we also have some interesting deposits uh, on Fremont Island. You can maybe see these things that look like my head a little bit, but they're actually made of metamorphosed basalts. These are pillow basalts that were erupted underwater during this time. So we have glaciation. We also have volcanism and rifting going on. Maybe even more surprising is what's on top of the diamictite. So here's the diamictite, and there is a cap dolomite, like it's going around, boom, like, like that. And so we're going to go from glaciers covering the earth to tropical seas. And not only that, these cap dolomites have a unique geochemistry and textures. Uh, these are what are called tube structures here. Here they are cross section here they're on top of one of these dolomites and they've been interpreted as some sort of weird gas escape structure plumbing system from unusual microbial mats that formed at this time so we're going to go from an ice house to a hot house and this model of what's called snowball earth the big proponent has been paul hoffman and he's here in this picture he came to utah to come look at our our rocks and he was impressed so, Snowball, we're here uh, 700 million years ago. It might have looked something like this. And it would have been mighty cold, as we'll see. Uh, but we also had some volcanoes going on. This is a picture from Antarctica. And they are releasing water vapor, but also carbon dioxide. And then we go to a hothouse. So how does that happen? And the answer is in what happens to that carbon dioxide, to the carbon cycle. Okay? So I'm going to show you the basic idea behind Snowball Earth. So somewhere around 720 million years ago, thereabouts, we have rodinia starting to break apart. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starts to come down. Uh, this is percent carbon dioxide on this axis. This is the latitude of the ice going from poles to equator. So present day carbon dioxide sits somewhere around here, 0.04%, 400 parts per million. It probably dropped down somewhere around 100 parts per million. And what's going to happen to Earth's climate then, like during the last glacial maxima here, it gets cold, we start growing ice caps. But the continents are in a little different position. The sun is actually a little bit cooler back then, and we start growing the ice caps, and how much sunlight is going to get absorbed? More or less as we grow the ice caps, more gets reflected, less gets absorbed, it gets colder, the ice cap grows, more gets reflected, it gets colder, until we get a runaway albedo effect, and 
we have an ice ball, okay? Reflecting that sunlight, the estimates are the average surface temperature got to minus 40 C. And I'm supposed to put things in Fahrenheit too, right? Um, fortunately, for, minus 40 C is also minus 40 Fahrenheit. <laughs> average global temperature. So how would you have liked to have been around then? Okay. And the thoughts are, depending on the model, that ice on the oceans could have been over a mile thick. But what's happening is that shuts down the weathering. We can't remove carbon dioxide from weathering. But volcanoes, they don't care. They're still going on, and that gas is leaking into the atmosphere. So the CO2 is going to slowly build up from very low to maybe what it is today to 1,000 parts per million to 10,000 parts per million to 30,000 parts per million. And what's going to happen to the temperature? It's going to slowly warm up, and eventually we start to melt at the low latitudes. What happens to the amount of sunlight absorbed? Goes up, we melt more ice, but the atmospheric CO2 now is like extreme, and we have an extreme greenhouse effect. The other thing is, uh, and the temperature is going to go up to average, like plus 40 C, which is over 100 Fahrenheit. And the atmosphere is charged with CO2, which means the rain's going to be acidic and hot. And what's that going to do to chemical weathering? And we take all of this bicarbonate, this calcium, we dump it into the ocean, and we make cap carbonates in perhaps a few thousand years. And that draws down the CO2. We get back, and we actually repeated this process during two snowballs, two different snowball events. And you might ask, well, what happened to life? Um, and colleagues Carol Daler, uh, Suzanne Porter at Santa Barbara, Carol up at Utah State have looked at some of these microfossils. So we don't have, you know, macrofossils, we have microbes. They ruled the earth for most of earth history. And we see fairly complicated uh, microfossils before snowball earth. This is from the Uinta Mountain Group in Utah. And afterwards, mainly algae. Some of it colonial, but we had mass extinction in the microbial world. But some of the microbes made it through. And this set the stage, along with increased oxygen slowly building up in the atmosphere, um, for evolutionary experimentation, I would say. And eventually, Kind of a delayed fuse, if you will, comes the Cambrian explosion of life. And something, again, that Lehigh studied extensively, um, more probably in the Ordovician, but a tremendous fossil record here in Utah. And at the time, again, where were we? Right near the equator with the tropical sea coming in. All right, tail three. Pass forward to the Jurassic only about 200 million years ago. I'm going to pass around a chunk of Navajo sandstone. Iconic formation uh, here in Utah. This is a paleogeographic reconstruction from Ron Blakey. And at this time, uh, Pangaea has formed and is starting to break apart initially. And we have drifted up and started to rotate around. We're now at about the latitude of the current Sahara Desert. So not on the equator, but in the horse latitudes. And um, this is the remnants of the Appalachian Mountains out here that formed as we put together Pangaea. Okay. And the orange in here, and it really should extend up past Thermopolis. We have the Navajo equivalent up there. And it probably extended up into Montana before being eroded. A huge sand sea in here. Okay. And we see that preserved, for instance, in the Great White Throne in Zion. And does that look like a lot of sand? <laughs> that is a lot of sand. Okay. Um, in fact, somewhere I did a uh, calculation here of how much sand. Um, each person in the United States would have if we took the Great Sand Pile. Um, 
being a professor, you know, this is a quiz now. <laughs> so let's say the population is 300 million. Okay. And you each get a football field. How thick would the sand be in that football field? Any idea? 300 million of you. So you have to divide the sand up so you can't have too much. You're close, yeah, probably be around 50 feet, 15 meters. That's preserved, there would have been more, so you're probably just about right there. Just unfathomable amount of sand. And it's a very interesting formation. It has these giant cross beds, some of them, what, uh, 20 meters high, 70 feet or more. And the inclination of these gives us the paleo wind direction, which varied, but was overall out of the north to northeast. Okay. And we think these were fossil sand dunes based on the sedimentary structures we see, but also looking in closer, this is a scanning electron microscope image. Again, a human hair would be something like that. Okay. So these are very fine grain sand. And they're quite pretty rounded, and they also have pits in them. And that's something that you see in modern sand dunes, is those sand grains are blowing along, saltating, bouncing, and knocking into each other. So, and then, and this, it's a false color image, but make it look very weird and eerie here. That little rounded thing there is a zircon grain. Okay, we'll come back to that. So here, imagine, Put your imaginary uh, goggles on here. This is what Utah would have looked like 200 to 190 million years ago. Uh, but with, we'll add one addition, maybe a carnivorous dinosaur uh, looking for a meal. Okay. So let's get back to zircon. So it's kind of like a bad relative. Uh, they're hard to get rid of, right? And uh, sometimes they remember too many family secrets. Okay, so again, um, thinking of zircon, remember it has uranium that decays to lead. But it also releases alpha particles, which is helium. So not only can we get a uranium lead age when that grain initially crystallized, who knows where before it got blown here, we can also get an age, cooling age. So helium doesn't start accumulating until zircon gets down to about 200 degrees C, 350 Fahrenheit, okay? Once it's being eroded up to the surface and it gets to that temperature, the helium starts accumulating, okay? So we can do double dating here. So uranium lead age and a helium age. Uh, and these are gonna be results from uh, Jeff Rawl, uh, initially worked on the Navajo. We continue to use this technique, but on some different problems. And we like graphs, right? So let's look at the axes. This is the uranium lead crystallization age. The vertical axis is the cooling age. And we certainly hope that the cooling age is younger than the crystallization age. And what we see are a couple of populations. There's a few grains that have very old crystallization ages. Archean, two and a half, 2.8 billion. And proterozoic cooling ages, one. 1 billion, 1.2 billion. Where can we find something like that? You go to the Canadian Shield, and that's what you find. However, most of the grains have younger crystallization ages. Some are what we call Grenville. If you remember that Grenville province as we made Rodinia along the eastern U.S., and as we made the early Appalachians in the early Paleozoic, 500, 400 million years old. So we see both those uranium lead crystallization ages, and cooling ages from a little over 400 down to almost 200 million years ago. And that would be when the Appalachian Mountains were eroding and cooling. So there's really only one place where we have that double dating going on, and that is the Appalachians. So when you look at that piece of nugget sandstone there, our Navajo sandstone. Where did most of that sand come from? 
the Appalachians. A long journey, so we think uh, big rivers coming off of that makes sense, combined with the trade winds, and something is happening in Utah that it's subsiding and we are able to accumulate. Like in Zion, what is that, 1,800 feet of sand? It's a lot of sand. All right, tale number four. Um, we're going to make an Andean mountain belt, mostly during Cretaceous time. But it started in the Jurassic and it went into the early tertiary. So another paleogeographic map from Ron Blakey. Um, and we see this mountain system stretching from Alaska to Mexico. And this is, in this part here, what we call the severe fold thrust belt. But also going on along the coast would have been a massive subduction zone and a big volcanic arc. And one other thing to note here, this thing coming down from the Arctic that ultimately connected with the Gulf of Mexico, the Western Interior Seaway. Because during the Cretaceous, by the time we get to 100 to 80, 90 million years ago, sea level has come up substantially. And part of that is because the ocean ridge system was more extensive. We had more rapid um, uh, divergence, um, more rapid plate motion, more active tectonic system probably. And that those big ocean ridges would displace seawater up and we flooded uh, parts of North America at that time. So this is what we think a cross-section of this would have looked like going from off uh, the Bay Area. It would have been a big trench, an accretionary complex, something in front of the arc, and then a big magmatic arc where the Sierras are. Some sort of plateau, and then we would have been in the fold thrust belt going off into a basin that was at times inundated by an inland sea. And a modern analogy, and we've done work down, that's why we went to work in Argentina, would be the Andes. So today, if you look there, we have a oceanic plate. This one's the Nazca. Up in uh, the Cretaceous North America, it was called the Farallon, an oceanic plate being subducted. And we have a trench there. Um, Big earthquakes. So, for instance, Great Chile earthquake, 1963, magnitude nine and a half. So, what would you expect to have also been happening in Western U.S. 100 million years ago? Magnitude nine earthquakes and tsunamis going off. Okay. A magmatic arc. That's what you would find. So, if you went to the Sierras, that's the roots of that arc that have now been uplifted and eroded but they would have been feeding a massive volcanic system and we find those volcanic ashes all the way here to Utah. And Doug's worked on a number of, of dating of those, of those ashes. So big magmatic arc. And then we have a mountain system in places it has an oceanic plateau, not continental plateau, um, like the Altiplano, and a fold thrust belt. So this is in the pre-Cordillera. So just imagine these big sheets of rock coming up and out, but they'd be coming from the west out there. Okay. And then finally a foreland. And in the case of Argentina here, that foreland gets uh, deformed by these big basement cord uplifts, much like we have in the Uinta Mountains, the Wind River Mountains, the Front Range of Colorado. So it starts out as a seaway, and then in some areas it gets uh, deformed by these foreland uplifts. So I um, spent a lot of my time working in the Utah, Idaho, Wyoming thrust belt. We'll go through this pretty uh, quickly, but a lot of years of work have gone into this. So notice that we have these major thrust faults. Uh, here by Salt Lake City, we have something called the Mount Raymond that goes into the Absarica thrust. We have the Willard thrust up. Um, and Ogden thrust near Ogden, a uh, whole series of these, and they have a big curved form to them. Okay? If you look at mountain systems, modern ones, ancient ones, the Alps, the Andes, are they straight or does nature like curves? Nature likes curves. And we think this happened 
from a combination of kind of a curved thrust slip spreading out like so, and also interaction with these foreland uplifts, like the UN is here, the Grovant and Ancestral Tetons up here. Okay. So we're going to take a look at a couple of cross sections real quickly. And these are well constrained by a lot of drill hole, a lot of seismic data. And this is the structural style. It's what we call thin skinned. So these are the sedimentary rocks. Remember, we deposited after we rifted away, broke up Rodinia, and we had that passive margin to the west. And Craton to the east, we laid down these sedimentary layers. This is the basement underneath. And then when we deform it, the sedimentary rocks slide above a basal, they call malar detachment. This is what we call thin skin. The basement only locally gets deformed, like here near Ogden, where remember we had that Wasatch hinge line where we went from thin to thick, like that. And as the thrust came in here, they shaved off little slices of that basement. And kind of an analogy, uh, you won't get mad at me, hopefully, is shoveling snow. Did folks have enough of that last <laughs> winter? Okay, so the sidewalk is going to be your basement. The snow is going to be your sedimentary rocks. Okay? And so as you're shoveling that snow, hopefully you don't pick up too many chunks of basement. If there's a lip in the basement and you have a plow, yeah, you might knock a few off like you did here last year. But otherwise... Snow piles up, but what does it make? It makes a wedge. And the more you shovel, the higher the wedge, and the bigger out it goes. And so the same thing was happening here. And so you might also think is the wedge, so which way did the wedge grow? If the thrusts are being moving things to the east, it would have grown progressively to the east. We actually have that record preserved here by looking at conglomerates from the organic strata. I'm going to pass one of these around here. And we can date these sedimentary rocks, uh, and they're big conglomerates. Uh, this is the Echo Canyon. Maybe it's hard to see, but they're classed in here roughly the size of Volkswagens. Couldn't bring that, so this one will, <laughs> this one will do. Uh, but we have probably the best long-term record of, of thrust timing anywhere on Earth here. We have synorogenic deposits preserved in northern Utah to western Wyoming that span 125 million to 50 million years ago. And it allows us to say, yeah, the Willard thrust out to the west came in first. Imagine that. Uh, by the time we get around 80 million years, the Absarica thrust comes in. That's about where we're at. And by 50 million years, the thrust front is out east of Evanston. So you can imagine sitting here in a time machine of those big thrust sheets popping up to the west, getting a little closer, conglomerates coming out, getting coarser, and finally you're in the snow pile. Okay. And another analogy is to a sand wedge, same idea. So as you start to shorten that, it piles up. And before you actually get a fault, you get internal shortening, what we call layer parallel shortening. And the same is going to happen in rocks. The same happens in the snow. You may not notice it, but it's going to start to kind of just bunch up without you even seeing it breaking. And then, boom, it'll break out, start to pile up a little, and break out. And so this is the pattern you see. And this is the pattern we see in Utah and western Wyoming. So I'm going to pass this next one around, um, rocks that structural geologists like. This is from the Willard Fault Zone, right here up by Willard Peak. That thrust alone had 40 miles, 60 kilometers of slip on it. And it brought in a sheet of rock, now mostly eroded, 15 kilometers, almost 10 miles thick. Just hard to fathom what that would have looked like. Um, for folks, this is for uh, folks if they're watching out at Weber State or other folks, uh, anyone uh, remember or think about the Z-fold in Ogden Canyon. 
Um, so a lot of internal deformation of well, this is associated with Lillard thrust, and maybe we'll be looking at that um, here tomorrow in the field or something nearby. Also, this internal deformation, this layer parallel shortening, these are reduction spots. They start out in 2D, roughly circular, and what are they now? Like so, this is the Twin Creek Formation limestone. It has a cleavage in it that again records this layer parallel shortening. And so spent a lot of years with a lot of students collecting data. So this is over 300 sites in different units around Utah, Wyoming, and Idaho showing the directions of that shortening and here are the directions of extension. And here are ellipses like those reduction spots. And we use a variety of techniques to get those. So again, the basic pattern is one of layer parallel shortening, thrusting, and development of that curved belt. It started out with curvature, and that curvature was enhanced during thrusting. So just very briefly, a tectonic model, starting with Back in the uh, Jurassic, we would have had a westward thickening snow pile, or sedimentary rocks, and it would have been thickest in the central part. We then start um, uh, deforming what was called the hinterland out in Nevada uh, in the later Jurassic, and it reaches into Utah by the early Cretaceous with that Willard thrust sheet. And these big mountain sheets uh, thrust sheets are forming, and again, where the snow is thicker, what's going to happen? It's going to build out further and higher. And that sheds sediment into the basin, so this is even worse than shoveling snow. As the snow gets comes off the top, you know, you can throw it off to the side. Here, it keeps accumulating out in a foreland basin in front, and you have to keep shoveling that recycled snow. And then by the middle Cretaceous, we are in the middle. We're in the fold thrust belt. And then finally by the end, when we get into the early tertiary, the thrust belt is now beyond us, out past Evanston, interacting with the Uinta uplift and the Grovant ancestral Tetons to the north. One more quiz question. <laughs> OK, so here's, uh, imagine you've got you're making the sand pile. You can do it with snow, too, if you want. So you're going to have to make a wedge here, uh, moving 100 kilograms of sand up an incline 10 meters. And we, we like uh, our scientific notation. That's 10 to the fourth joules. Okay. So now imagine northern Utah. Um, we can estimate the amount of gravity work from the cross section. We had internal deformation from shortening and folding is a little harder, but Humor me and we'll say it's similar. That's 10 to the 23rd. That's a lot of zeros. So the question is, oops. <laughs> Somehow messed that up. Uh, <laughs> how many people and how long to make that? There we go. <laughs> Nobody liked the quiz, I guess. <laughs> they were like, stop it. Yeah, that's my students. They say, I hate math. <laughs> so, yeah it, yeah, it had something. Yeah, it just went ahead on me. Yeah, so there's the answer. Pretty much everyone in America, you get to do 100 uh, bags a day for 50 million years. And the final tale here, um, Lake Bonneville, the remnant uh, here, Great Salt Lake. You can see some of the shorelines on Fremont Island here. And we'll talk very briefly about the Wasatch Fault. So again, talking about building on the work of others, G.K. Gilbert did such amazing, such a great observationalist, such a great scientist. Uh, came here, noticed the shorelines. Uh, here's his original map, mapped those out and said, okay, what, what is this? This was Lake Bonneville, a lake roughly the size of Lake Michigan that went into parts of Nevada, Idaho, down past Delta, Utah, over 1,000 feet deep in places. 
So imagine being here 20,000 years ago. If we were on the lake bottom, we'd be, what, about 1,000 feet of water above us, 300 meters. Or let's, I'd, I'd rather envision being on a boat up there, <laughs> floating along, going to the Bonneville shoreline, and you would see glaciers coming down, little Cottonwood Canyon, all the way to the lake. And you would see that lake extending out to Nevada. The tip of Antelope Island would still be above water, but many of the areas underwater. And the high point was the Bonneville shoreline reached about 19,000 years ago. And it turns out we have that shoreline well preserved that we can see behind our campus at Weber State. The same is true at University of Utah, Utah State, Brigham Young. And we have the Wasatch Fault Scarp there. So we're going to go back 20,000 years ago and see what it looks like. <laughs> and I'm not going to worry about lab this afternoon, so. Uh, but just hard to imagine, you know. But did it stay at that level? So it was during the last glacial maxima. Um, so imagine, you know, it was colder time. Could have been wetter. Imagine the lake effect snow is coming from this. Now some good skiing, but the lake was rising up and it eventually spilled over its northern end at Red Rocks Pass over unconsolidated material. And you've probably built sand dams or mud dams or whatever as a kid. What happens? They break. So that happened uh, here and it eroded down about 360 feet over 100 meters in probably a matter of weeks to maybe a, a, a little over a month, making the Bonneville flood that went out up towards Pocatello down the Snake River out to the Columbia, actually flooded part of what's Portland now, made a lake there. Uh, and folks have looked at the size of the boulders this carried and the width of the channel and come up with an estimate of flow. Somewhere around 30, 40 million CFS, cubic feet per second. To put that in perspective, uh, Snake River, before it gets dammed up here, major flood stage is a little over 100,000 CFS. The Amazon, 7 million CFS. So I want you to try and imagine, or maybe not, uh, taking a raft trip out the <laughs> outlet to the Pacific Ocean. Uh, it's just phenomenal. And end with just a couple of slides on the Wasatch Fault. So we live in earthquake country. Okay? Uh, and if you didn't know that, you probably were rattled awake by the 2020 magna earthquake. So kind of a <coughs> funny story here. Uh, that was also when, guess what hit at that time? COVID. And we'd just gone to remote teaching. And so I was in my basement, you know, 7 in the morning. I'm like, okay, got to put together something that for today's topic is Utah earthquakes. I'm going to look at a simulation of ground shaking in the Salt Lake Valley that the USGS had done. So I was watching the simulation as the waves are coming and amplifying, and then Literally, I start shaking. I'm like, what the heck? Great simulation. Great simulation. And then Mary Ellen shouts out, was that an earthquake? That was an earthquake. Did you feel that? And, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> so I'm not doing any more simulations for this talk. <laughs> um, but that was a magnitude 5.7. And where do most people in Utah live? Along the Wasatch Front. What magnitudes have we had in the past? Multiple of magnitude 7 to seven and a half in the last few thousand years from trenching studies. The Magna um, earthquake has a couple of lessons for us, I think. So one was it was complicated and it was along a segment boundary between the Weber segment here, the Salt Lake City segment. And I'm going to show you, the, uh, I think the next slide, the boundary between the Salt Lake City and the Provo segments. It also has micro seismicity and it had a moderate earthquake back in 1991. So looking at the aftershock distribution and the focal mechanisms, uh, various folks, I don't see Emily 
here, um, including Pang and others, uh, and several other folks have looked at this. And the idea is that that earthquake occurred at a depth of about 10, 11, 12 kilometers on the Wasatch Fault. But for that to happen, the fault has to not be real steep. So this is Pang's interpretation. This is mine um, in red. And basically, you're looking at um, steep right at the surface, but then about 45 degrees, 40 degrees, and down to 30 degree dips in some areas. And why is that important? So think of a magnitude 7 happening on a fault like this, the previous standard model versus a fault like that. Where's the epicenter going to be? Further out, what's going to be the distribution of ground shaking? Wider and more extreme. So Ivan Wong and others have started uh, modeling this. So it's caused a rethinking of ground shaking hazards in, along the Wasatch Front. The other thing is it was very noisy. I want to say there were over 2,000 aftershocks recorded. That's a lot. And again, that speaks to these segment boundaries. They're very noisy. They can initiate major earthquakes. They can stop major earthquakes. And at some point, rather than a magnitude 5.7, starting and not quite getting through, it'll break out the gate of that segment boundary and take out the Weber, the Salt Lake, the Prola segment with a magnitude 7 plus. We've also done some work at the south end of the Salt Lake City segment. Segment boundary here, Traverse Mountains, complicated. Uh, here's the focal mechanism for this 1991 earthquake and a structure contour model. And the dip, based on the structure contour model, the focal mechanism, 35 degrees. So again, it's something we need to think about. These are just sketches of the fault zone coming around the segment boundary, getting increasingly complicated. So you can imagine that nucleating an earthquake Rupture is a simple process we understand well are complicated again. So the Wasatch Fault, we have heard this not if, but when. And the other lesson I think we can take from the Magna Earthquake is that was a magnitude 5.7. A magnitude 7.2 earthquake would release around 200 times as much energy. The Magna earthquake produced over or caused over a hundred million dollars in damage, direct damage to structures, and um, more indirect economic loss. So the estimates are for a magnitude 7, 7.2 earthquake on the Wasatch Fault. We're probably looking at the potential for other people have come up with this, thousands of deaths, and definitely tens of billions, if not more, in damage. So the question is, you know, how do we prepare for that? So that was our final tale. So let's just kind of go quickly back through. We've looked at two and a half billion years of history in, I guess, closer to 60 minutes, but Farmington Canyon basement, a snowball earth, a great sand pile, an Andean belt going from Alaska to Mexico through Utah, Lake Bonneville, and uh, interesting photo here. Um, I think Bob Smith probably took this. This is uh, Jim Petchman um, here at the 1983 Bora Peak earthquake scar. So I asked my class this the other day, and I guess I can't help myself. How many of you have heard of the Bora Peak earthquake? So quite a few folks here. Uh, my class, guess how many? <laughs> None. So this is a potentially a pretty dang good analog for a magnitude 7 earthquake on the Wasatch Fault. So hope this has inspired your imagination and you'll go out with fresh eyes and keep exploring. And uh, again, just feel honored, humbled, and just having so many great colleagues here in the room. I really, and students, appreciate that.